live. Hey friends, welcome back to my channel. It's Tori and today I have the distinct pleasure of getting a chance to chat with fantasy author Michael J. Sullivan, the author of, let's see if I get them all right, Ryuria Revelations, Ryuria Chronicles, Hollow World, Legends of the First Empire, and The Rise and the Fall, which is the new trilogy. Did I get them all? <laughs> Probably. Probably. Uh, yeah, you left that one book, but that's okay. Um, uh oh. <laughs> but but it's now Ryuria is fine. I don't care. But how I pronounce it is Ryuria. Three syllables. Ryuria. Yeah, Got I it. know. I know that's not how it seems to be written. But I was told by Tim Gerard Reynolds, my narrator, he says, you know, it doesn't matter how it's written; it's how you pronounce it. I'm like, fine. Right. So we've agreed to just like make up stuff. <laughs> You know what? I think if you wrote the book, you're allowed to pronounce it however you want. I'm pretty sure I, that's how it works. Yeah, yeah. I make up words. Yeah, me, yeah. And me and Shakespeare, we're like, we're like this. Right, right. So the, the benefit of being a fantasy author, you can just make up a word if you need one. <laughs> I, I complain to my wife all the time that I can rewrite grammar because grammar comes from usually written works and I'm an author. So, hey. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Never flies with her. <laughs> I can't imagine why. <laughs> um, so really quickly for anyone who is not familiar with your work, um, I do, for everyone in the comments or watching the replay, I do have the information and website for Michael Sullivan down in the description box below where he has an extended version of his bio, which is incredibly fascinating, by the way. I had a really good time reading it this morning. Um, and I would love to hear, as you put it, kind of the <laughs> the nutshell version of your writing journey, just uh, for everyone who's new. Okay. <laughs> so I was born. In <laughs> <laughs> you can start wherever you like. <laughs> so technically, it does go back a little ways because uh, I didn't like reading as a kid. Mm -hmm. um, I, at the age of 12, I decided to read a really bad coming of age novel. Um, called Big Red, and I hated it. I was not really thrilled with writing, and but I, I decided that when I got to be, you know, 60, 70 years old, I wanted to be able to tell people, hey, I completed a book cover to cover. So I did that. And I pushed through that, and I was done. I was never going to read again. Uh, but then I stumbled across this really weird book called The Lord of the Rings. Ah. Uh. It be sitting on a shelf, and it was calling to me. And the weird thing was, is the reason for it was because my brother had read it. My brother's 10 years older than I am. So he read it when he was in his early teens, and uh, he woke me up in the middle of the night to tell me about this great story. Now, I'm like five years old and I have no <laughs> idea what he's telling me. But he plastered the walls of my room with the covers of these books and maps and everything. And it was something that I had known from my very early youth. And then we moved. All that went away. And then I came back. Uh, it wasn't until I was like 13 years old and I saw the cover and I went, how do I know this? I couldn't recall it, but it was like talking to me because I had grown up with it in my room, but I didn't know it was there. Yeah. I got so I picked it up and started reading it. And I'm like, this is weirdly familiar, but I don't know how it is. And it's because I remembered him telling me this when I was half asleep. Mm -hmm. so that drew me into it. And I read all the books and I was like, this is fantastic. So I went to the bookstore. This is about the mid early 70s. And I went looking for another book to, you know, this is a whole new world. There are books like this. I went out to get another one and there wasn't. And yeah. I didn't know what to do. So I ended up starting writing my own. So I, I started writing in a notebook with a pen and then I got my sister's old manual typewriter and I started using that. So I started writing novels. So I had written little short stories and then I got into high school. I wrote three novels, fantasy novels. Uh, and weirdly enough, they were about a, 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 a thief and a good fighter, <laughs> which is kind of reflective. Yeah. And there was a lot of similarities there. So I wrote that. Then I went on and my wife, I met her and she told me about this guy named Stephen King. And mm -hmm. she introduced me to some science fiction. So I started reading much more broadly. And mm -hmm. I kind of drifted away from fantasy. Uh, but then I started to learn how to write. And in learning how to write, I wrote a number of different kinds of books. I wrote horror. I wrote, uh, let's see, coming, in eight, coming of age books. I wrote uh, science fiction books. I did a lot of different books. And I wrote about 12 of them. The 13th one was actually good. Uh, but when I sent it out to an agent, and this is, you know, I spent, I don't know, 20 years. And when I sent it out to an agent, they came back and said, this is no good. You're never going to get published because I love the book. The writing is great. The characters are great. Even the title is great. But your story is about a male 
and women don't read about males and men only read about courtroom dramas or war movie or war type things. And I'm like, I don't do that. So <laughs> I don't have a career. So I stopped. So I gave up. And then I went and I started an advertising agency because I wanted to be a grown up because I had spent my whole life. My, my wife had become an electrical engineer and she took care of us. I took care of the kids. And when I was taking care of the kids, I, I wrote books. But then I figured the kids were grown up. It was time for me to get a real job because that was the same place I was when I got out of high school. Mm -hmm. So I started an advertising agency, did very well, but I swore off writing because I had written 13 novels, all of which went into a drawer and no one ever read them. Mm -hmm. But then uh, we were very successful with the advertising agency. And then I got really bored of that because I was doing the same things over and over again. Finally, I said, well, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, so Robin kind of got a job and she says, well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, weirdly enough, I'm really bored. I'm going to try and write again because I had this idea for a story. And I thought I'm never going to publish it because if I try and publish it, just that expectation ruined it for me. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to put these on the internet for free. Anyone wants to read them. Great. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't care. And I started writing these books and it just happened to be writing this, you know, five series, five book series turned out to be a six book series, as you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I kind of based it on the concept of I was watching Babylon 5. And Babylon 5, if you don't know, is a science fiction show back in the 90s in which uh, the person who wrote it wrote the entire five season arc in advance of the pilot, which is insane because he didn't even know if it would be picked up. And yeah. Crazy things like the main character doesn't even show up for the second season. But these are all interconnected and they make sense. And I went, my God, this is the future of television. This is so <laughs> great. And just as I thought it was going to take off with Buffy the Vampire Slayer doing the same kind of deal. And all of a sudden, we got the writer's strike. And suddenly, yeah. all we had was reality TV. And then it just kind of went away. So I thought, you know, what would be great is if I was a producer of a show, I would do a medieval fantasy type of show. Because it's never been done at that time on TV before. At least it hasn't been done well. Because they're either slapsticky or they're, or they're, you know, very formal. It's like, we will go out and kill and slay thy beast, you know, kind of thing. And mm. you know, I wanted a real show. I wanted a real show with real people. Yeah. But I couldn't, I'm not a publisher. I'm not, I'm not a producer, but I could write books. Mm. So for the fun of it, I started writing a series of books in which like each book would be like a season, but they'd mm -hmm. have this long five year arc. And that's what I started doing. And that was the Ryer Revelations. And uh, I got done with that. And when I wrote the last few sentences of that, I was like, oh, my God, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. I blew myself away. I was like, this is actually like not the best thing I've ever written. This is like the best thing I've ever read. And I was mm -hmm. just so happy. And I was just like turned around and there was no one in the house. I'm like, great. And I realized <laughs> it hit me just then that this book series is now going to go in a drawer in the attic yeah. and you're going to see it again. And that was really depressing. And I got really depressed. And then my wife noticed and she said, you know, what's wrong? I said, nothing. She said, no, no. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> like, nothing. She's like, no, no. What is it? I said, well, you know, I wrote all these books and they're really good and no one's ever going to read them. She's, oh, honey, I'll read them. I'm like, oh, great. You know, <laughs> so I read them and she's like, oh, this is very nice. We talked about it. She read the second book. We talked about it. We read the third book. We kind of talked about it. We read the fourth book. And she's like, I'm <clears throat> just give me the next book. And then I got to the next book and she's like, yeah, I don't care. Just shut up. Give me another book. And then the last book that my wife is, a, you know, as a workaholic, she never stayed home. Man. But she she called in and said she's taking she's taking a day off because she needs to read this book. And she woke me up in the morning, said, where is the last book? And I'm like, really? And I said, can we talk? No, just give me the book. I'm like, oh, OK, so I guess you're enjoying it. Um, she really liked it. And as a result of that, she decided to make it her life's work to make sure these things got published. As a result of that, um, we sent this book out to a number of, number of different people. I had an agent for a short time and we finally did get uh, no one to be interested. And we still had some, some mail out for some people, but we realized no one was going to pick it up. So my wife started learning how to do self-publishing and this was before eBooks. Yeah. So she got a print run done of these very small little books and she was going to sell them out of the back of the car and she, <laughs> she was going to do it. And then we noticed there was an email we missed three months ago coming from a very small publisher in Minnesota that said they wanted it. And we went, Oh, Oh, 
And my wife's like, crap, I worked very hard to learn how to do this. And <laughs> now I don't have to. Uh, so she ended up started teaching how to, how to do self-publishing before that, or right after that, because she had all this knowledge. But we did self-publish the first two books. Now, unfortunately, that company was not very good at, at their business model. Mm. Yeah, I was the only books that were selling. Um, yeah. all kinds of problems where we literally had to go and buy my books from the warehouse because they were not paying their bills and they were holding my books ransom. So it was off of Amazon, but it was a big deal. But we managed to buy the rights back from them. Mm. And then we started self-publishing ourselves. And this was right at the time that eBooks came off. Kindle came out and we were like, this is great. So we started selling a little bit at a time, a little bit of time, first book and the second book, then the third book. Finally, we got to the uh, the fifth book, and that was about the same year that the iPad came out, the Kindle 2 came out. Mm. It was Christmas, and suddenly poof, all kinds of sales started hitting. And my wife went, hmm, and she went back to New York, the big guys. And she said, and she's really good at this because she's, she's a business genius. She did a spreadsheet. She explained how much I was making and wow. what you want part of this cash because we got a lot of it. <laughs> and they said, sure. So there was a little bidding, or there wasn't a bidding war, but this preemptive bid uh, from Hachette or Orbitz, the subsidiary of that. And we published through them. That went well for Raiera. Uh, uh, they repackaged it. My six books became three books and, and I was managed uh, and I was pieces. And then uh the next thing i wrote was i was thinking about doing a prequel series but i wasn't going to do anything else with the lawn that was done but mm -hmm. my wife really wanted me to do something else and so when i pulled all my books off the internet because orbit wouldn't let me have my old books on there so i had to pull it off for three months there'd be nothing by me my wife says well i don't like that mm -hmm. so why don't you write a short story i'm like i don't write short stories yeah, you write novels <laughs> anyway. and i'm like i don't really know how to do this because it's totally different and mm -hmm. uh, all right so i started writing what would be the first chapter of a novel and uh we put that up in the meantime and it's still out there strangely enough and it turned out that i went actually that would make a good book so i started writing that book and i got halfway through it and it was taking place in the second year that royce and hadrian if you know those books yeah and uh, they said and I, I got halfway through it. I'm like, I'm an idiot. Why don't I start with the origin story? Yeah. <laughs> I went back to the first book. So I wrote the crown, the crown tower. And then I wrote the second book. So it became two books because I was kind of stupid to start off with. Anyway, that's how the Chronicle started. And, but I didn't want to keep writing. So I said, I'm just going to do those two. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And then they wanted another series. And I'm like, all right, what am I going to write about? And I was going to think about doing something completely different, a whole new genre, but no. Uh, there was a problem because when I wrote Raya Revelations, I lied. I lied a lot about the history. Uh, I, in fact, when I first wrote it, a friend of mine said, you know, that, that history story of, of Nephron and, and how the empire was and how he betrayed his own people for the love of a woman. She goes, that's really sappy. I'm like, well, yeah, but that's not what really happened. That's how the legend came yep. down. And yeah, they, they make it this like a romance thing. I said, but that's not the real truth. And I went, I really got to explain that. <laughs> so I started writing this other series and it became Legends of the First Empire, which tells the origin story of the empire. And it starts off way back in time when mankind is, is in the Bronze Age. They're just barely out of the Stone Age. And you see the reality of how that actually came about. Yeah. And that became that. Then I said to myself, okay. So I have this series over here that takes place in the Bronze Age. I have this series over here that would take place in what the medieval period is. I need the middle. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started creating what's known as the Rise and Fall, which was previously known as the Bridge series because it connects the two. And um, that's probably the most of it. I'll let you ask another question because I'll just keep going. No, that was awesome. Well, and I want to make sure we mentioned today that Ezra Haddon, which is book three in that Rise and Fall, is out in audiobook and ebook you said today correct that is correct audio and ebook comes out now the print book won't be out until december when it's, those are ready but we can still get a hold of it in the two other formats which is very exciting i can't wait to read those especially because for anybody like me who's been through revelations i'm very intrigued <laughs> yeah that was kind of interesting because 
of all the books I wrote, I figured this last one, the last book in the Rise and Fall series would probably pique a lot of attention because the book is entitled Ezra Hadden, which is a rather interesting character from Raya Revelations, who most people seem to find to be an interesting character. And I figured mm -hmm. that being the titular character of the book, they're going to be like, oh, I definitely want to read this. So, yeah. And, and yeah. It's this is the only print copy, but this is you can see this is a huge book for me. Yeah, we write books that big. Yeah. Someone asked me this said, "Are you taking tips from Brandon Sanderson?" I'm <laughs> yeah, right. I don't. I don't know how he does it. To be perfectly honest. <laughs> um, so, with all of these different entry points to the world that you've created, is there a spot that now that you have those three different entry points, that if somebody's brand new to your work in this world? that you would recommend them starting in a specific area or is it pretty fluid where people can start wherever they like so when i conceived the series i really didn't want people to get you know in a situation where they start in the wrong spot sure uh, i have had people start everywhere and they don't seem to have too much trouble with it awesome now when i wrote it i wrote it in a certain order obviously yep. i wrote it with revelations first starting with theft of swords and i wrote that series and then I went to uh, Legends First Empire while also interspersing Chronicles at the same time. And then finally, The Rise and Fall. And quite frankly, you should probably read it that way because that's how I wrote it. And the reason why that's important, even though it's not in chronological order, it is where my mind was when I was writing it. So I knew what was happening. And if you read it, you'll follow along the same way that I'm thinking about it. So that's why I usually suggest that route, even though it's not chronological. But mm. I was well aware of the fact that in the future, when all my books are done, they're probably going to be most people starting chronologically, starting right. with the myth and then reading all the way through. So I tried to make sure that I didn't have really bad spoilers. Now, inevitably, there's going to be a couple of really bad spoilers because there's no way to get around it. But what will happen right. is depending on whether you start with Age of Myth or Theft of Swords, um, you're going to have a different reading experience. And I can't do anything yeah. about that. Yeah. But both should be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, for me, at least starting in Revelations, that was me falling in love with this kind of access pairing of characters of Royce and Hadrian. And I think I'm interested in the world now because of the two of them. And that makes me excited to, like, keep expanding and, and learn more about their, you know, going into Chronicles next and then kind of working my way backwards. Well, the interesting thing here is that when I wrote Theft of Swords, I did something very unusual. I don't think you'll find too many authors who have ever done this. Uh, but the reason I did it was because I didn't plan to get published. And that's important. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I intentionally, when I watched movies or read books or seen television shows, they always start off with this really great first book or movie. And then the next one isn't quite as good because they're trying yeah. to recapture. And the next one after that tends to lose it. It just kind of goes downhill. Um, I didn't want that. So I intentionally wrote the first book to be the worst one mm. uh, so that each book would get better than the one before. And how I did this was the first book is an introductory book. It's just not much depth in it. I intentionally mm. did not give you depth because I didn't want you to get bogged down in the world building. I didn't want you to have yeah. to learn this crap. I wanted you to have a good time. I wanted it to be easy. I wanted to be like when you open the cover of my book, it's like opening a door and you step in and you fall and you can't get back mm. out because it's so yeah. easy. I didn't want you to have to climb up. Yeah. So that book is designed to be very simple. I don't ask a lot of you. It's fun. It's fairly quick paced. And it seems superficial for people who are experienced in fantasy because that's how I designed it. I designed it for a first time reader, maybe someone's never mm -hmm. read it, to just get into it. And yeah. then we'll build. And I like the idea of world building uh, when you don't realize you're learning it. So at, so at some point you're like, I don't even know how I know this, but I know it. Yeah. And because in the old days, in the 70s and 80s, they used to have like a whole prologue, which was just like, we're going to give you an entire novel here. <laughs> History lesson. So that you are up to speed. And then we'll start to start. But I didn't want that. So I integrated yeah. it very subtly so that when you need to know that information, you already know it. You don't even know how you do it. So mm -hmm. that got better and better. So for people who are not uh, maybe fans of fantasy or not experienced with fantasy or maybe don't even think they'd like fantasy, Theft of Source is a pretty good starting point. But if you are experienced at fantasy, you might find that to be a bit shallow. So mm -hmm. if you went to Legends, that's a more complicated story. That's a more normal epic fantasy with a lot of characters and a lot of depth. So those are two. And I also got better writing because you get yeah. better writing a book. So, so that's yeah. slightly better prose in that one. 
Well, and I was going to ask you too, because you mentioned at the very beginning of your writing journey, those 13 books that you had written at the very start, you wrote in quite a few different genres. Do you think that writing across those different genres helped you write fantasy specifically? Like, did you bring some of your experience with those different genres in? Uh, writing anything is going to make you better. It's not mm -hmm. specific fantasy, it's specific to anything. Yeah. Um, what I actually did, because I never actually like had a class in it, I never read a book on it, I actually mm -hmm. taught myself. And what I would do was I would find authors that were either people who I really liked mm -hmm. or people who were like award-winning and were very well received in the public. I mean, I would look up for books that had won both the Nobel and Pulitzer Prize and I would read that. Uh, I read Steinbeck. I said Stephen King. I read, you know, John Updike. Everything I could get my hands on that was really well known and known to be good. And some of them I hated. I didn't really like yeah. writing. Yeah. Uh, but what I did was I read more than one book by them. And then I tried to write a book in their style. Yeah. As if I was them. And in doing that, I learned always, I learned something that they were doing that was really good. Sometimes yeah. I'm like, I, I really don't like this. This is really boring. But my God. The prose is amazing. Yeah. You know that this person is constantly describing things, never using the thing itself. I went, that's incredible. And it's more, it's more descriptive. I'm like, these right. are amazing things I learned. So I learned an enormous amount by just dissecting book upon book upon book. So for those 13 books that I wrote, each one was me trying to emulate another author. Right. Simply to learn how to write. Yeah. Um, and so when I threw that all away and started writing fantasy just because I wanted to do something fun. I wanted to write something that I was looking for that didn't exist. Right. Um, I started writing in my own style, but my own style is obviously a com you know, combination of these. But then right. when I would get to something, like when I wanted to make a really creepy scene, I would go and remember, I remember H.P. Lovecraft. I'm like, mm -hmm. great, so I'm going to use that concept here. And mm -hmm. if I was writing a character who was like, really had a really unusually creepy weird sort of mentality and i wanted to really get in their head i go to stephen king for that because he was really yep. so i would pull these things that i had learned so i consider them like a toolbox these yeah. are the tools i've developed i've learned how to use them i just employ them now but they're all now part of my voice if you will and right. they all become part of that yeah well and i think as as writers sometimes we we undervalue the importance of mimicry in learning how to write because in all these other art forms, that's how people start, you know, where you're playing an instrument or you're doing um, visual art or anything like that. Mimicry is how we start learning those different art forms. So I think oftentimes mimicry and writing craft gets a kind of a bad rap and I'm not really sure why, because <laughs> I think it's a really important well, way to learn to it, learn it, more. It's funny because you mentioned that because I, I mean, I started out as a commercial artist. That's, mm -hmm. I, got a, I got a scholarship to, go to art school and so i was going to be a commercial artist and i and that's i eventually became that with my advertising agency but yeah i mean when i learned art i learned by copying literally i would look yep. and i would draw what i saw in a drawing and that taught yep. me how to do that and then i got to doing my own and that was how i self-taught myself both mm -hmm. art and uh writing and then i finally did take a course at uh, university or george washington university and which they had this little special uh, McKean sort of workshop and they had a very well-known author there who was the writer in residence that year who was teaching the course and she found out that I had just published my first book and she's like you're published why are you here I said because mm. I don't know anything about writing I'm here to <laughs> and she looked at me I said she was telling me what do you mean I said well I, I've never had a class I've never read a book I've never been to a workshop I don't know the first thing about writing and she looked at me and she goes that's probably why you're published. Mm. And you probably realize that, but it's true. It's like, yep. I never learned all the things that I shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So I was just learning by rote. And the interesting thing is it's like, it's like if someone were to tell you an equation and say, this is how you solve this problem, and they give you the equation. I never got that. I had to work the equation out myself. So yep. I understand all the basis behind that. So right. unfortunately, though, I'm not a very good teacher, and I do try teaching a lot. <laughs> But I don't know how to teach because I've never been taught. Yeah. But you know what it is. So, I mean, I can, I can, I have to remember how it is I do it. And then right. figure out a way to explain that. So that, that's yeah. it. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I had kind of a similar experience to some degree because when I got to college and started my English degree, I had already self-published several books at that point. And like you, like it was all self-taught. I hadn't taken any classes. I was just writing what I wanted to read and I wanted to try stuff. And I got to college and that was really difficult for me to start like, oh, wait, there's 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 boxes suddenly, you know, and that was really difficult to, to like rearrange my brain for that. <laughs> um, I definitely want to grab there's been a couple of comments that I wanted to make sure I highlighted for you. Um, Esme is a wonderful book reviewer and a friend of mine, and she's in the Netherlands. Um, but she wanted to say that Sullivan you, is you are one of her favorite authors and she's oh. wishing us both an amazing chat. Um, well, you're one of my favorite fans. She's amazing. She is absolutely incredible. Um, lots of people wanting to watch Babylon 5 in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it, it's, it's interesting because it's a really good show, but unfortunately it didn't have a large budget. So sure. the props and stuff is are just terrible and it's dated <laughs> because it's from the 90s. But the, the, the plot and the story and the way the characters develop are amazing. Yeah. So it's just a cult classic at this point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a question about Royce and Hadrian, but we will definitely get there uh, in a second. I wanted to highlight this one too. S. Howard, hi, Michael. The Ryer Revelations got me through some tough times, so thank you. Oh. Matt, yeah. as I, a fellow... I don't think oh, I ahead. can see these. Is it, should I be seeing comments or not? They're on, so I have in my studio, I have a little comments box. Oh, okay. Box. So I'm not supposed to see them. Okay. No, no. Right. Um, if you were on the YouTube, had YouTube on in a separate tab, then you'd probably be able to see them under the video, but I will pop up um, anybody's questions that they have for you for sure. Um, as a fellow dust jacket hater, your bookshelf gives me the highest possible glee. <laughs> well, dust jackets, as you can see by the name, are designed to keep the dust off, but once you buy the book, you're supposed to take that off. It used to be just brown paper. Uh, yeah. How this ever got to be a thing, but whenever I read them, they always get in my way. So yeah, I have, oh, you can't see can't. that, but in front of me, I have all my books and none of them have a dust jacket. <laughs> yes, I, I usually get rid of those. I can't read them with dust jackets on either. Drives me nuts. Um, this is a question that I will definitely kind of roll into the end of our conversation, but Matt wanted to know um, if there are any plans to create a new fantasy series in a completely different world. This is funny because I just did a podcast last night in which a similar topic came up. And the point is, no. And the reason is because I'm lazy. <laughs> um, so I went to a great deal of effort to build this world. And yeah. it was really, and, and as I was trying to explain last night was the fact that when I, the way I write, there's a reason for that. I was asked by Orbit when I first brought the books to them, they said, can't you do things like, instead of using castles and kings and knights, can't you change, change those to be something else and just, just name them something else. So it's more unique to your world. And I went, no, because then the reader has to learn a whole new language and decipher what I'm giving them. And that's just going to get in the way of yeah. the story and the characters. It's so much easier if you under, if I say the word goblin, you don't have to worry about what I'm talking about. If I say dragon, I don't have to describe this thing to you. You got it. Mm -hmm. So my words could be better spent developing a character or developing dialogue or developing a, a situation rather than explaining, okay, so this word now means this, which is just, I find that to be somewhat dumb. So I don't do that, which is why the, my stuff tends to seem to be very traditional. Mm. Um, but it's just me using shorthand saying, people already know this stuff. I'm just going to use it. Yeah. That way I can focus on the more important stuff. Right. Um, so you, you took down the question. I love right. it. Here we go. <laughs> uh, so that being said, I built this world. And yeah. since I already built the world, I don't have to explain it again. I can focus mm. on the stories in it. <clears throat> it's yeah. like I've, I'm almost writing in a contemporary word now. I, I can say things that my readers are going to go, oh, I, I know what that means. Mm -hmm. Be subtle about it. So it makes it a lot easier. But if I were to write in something that wasn't Elan, it would be a different genre. I probably would sure. leave Elan entirely. But I'm not going to go the effort to create a whole new fantasy world whenever I got one. Yeah. And, and I know a lot of people do that. I know a lot of people are like, oh, this was great. I'm going to make a totally different world. But for me, that's, that's not that enticing. Yeah. I, would, well, it, I would write horror. I would write science fiction. And sure. I, but uh, yeah, I would probably not stay in this area. So after fantasy, what would you say is your favorite genre to write in? It's interesting. It's not so much a famous. I mean, certain things are easier. Mm. But when I was young, there were certain things that annoyed the heck out of me. 
Like in the 70s, there was a lot of horror. But the yeah. horror was always really bad in a sense that the bad guys always won. And I, I never liked that. And I didn't like the fact that it always seemed stacked against the good guys. It was like there would always be these demons or devils. And the good guys, I'm like, if you have evil, you have to have good of equal nature. But it wasn't. It was like you're totally outmatched every single time. And I went, mm -hmm. I want to write one that equals out. If, if you've ever read Stephen King's uh, Salem's Lot, what I liked about that was that he kind of brought a modern sensibility to an old story like Dracula. Mm -hmm. And of course, Twilight did something later on. But it was, it was like taking what would really happen if you took real people and put real modern people and put them in this age old problem. And mm -hmm. I liked that. And I liked it seemed real that people were doing normal things. So when I was writing in, in I would like to see something in horror where you have realistic people who don't act stupid. <laughs> um, and, and, it would just be far more refreshing to have real people who are, you know, kind of fun, capable, going up against an equal enemy as opposed to being just, there's just no hope. You're, you're right. Just out. Uh, it would just be neat. I mean, if yeah. you're an evil devil or something, you should have like an equal angel popping up out of nowhere or something too, because why not? I mean, you can. <laughs> in science fiction, there's always a lot of really cool things you can do with that. I, I wrote yeah. several really, really great ones of that in the past. They weren't well written because they didn't know how to write, but the idea was good. So yeah. those are the two I'd probably be most interested in is horror and science fiction, just because I would like to see what I could do with that genre. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt. Final comment, but I just wanted to say you absolutely rock for putting out the extras page on your blog spot, as well as the book recaps from Legends. Every fantasy author needs to do this, well, <laughs> especially when the worlds are that big. <laughs> quite frankly, that's not me. That's my wife. Man. I will pass <laughs> Yay, Robin. <laughs> um, Chris, I like the idea of the first book being easily accessible, even if it reads simpler. It makes starting a new series author less intimidating and daunting and more inviting to new readers. And yeah. that was the point. Yeah. Well, and I think too, like with just from my experience with Revelations, it was really cool because I didn't even think about it until you were talking about it here. But my focus was so heavily on the characters because I wasn't, you know, trying to figure anything else out. I just, okay, yep, we're in a castle and we're in the, like, it was a very easy visual con uh, construct. And then we could really focus in on the characters, which, you know, I think at least for that series, for sure, are the heart of the story. Well, so. the interesting thing there was that it was stupid and I didn't get to explain why it was stupid is because when you're trying to get published, you want to make your first book really strong. Otherwise you mm -hmm. won't pick up and no one will read you. And I've had a number of people read that book and go, yeah, I really couldn't get into it. It was really superficial. And the character is really shallow. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> you have to be that way. And, and I'm like, sorry, but that's why you shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. But somehow I managed to get through that and it worked. Yeah. Um, Bryce from Shelf Centered wants to know, was Hollow World one of those initial 12 books you wrote? And was, are, is there any interest in going back to time travel sci-fi? Um, e, no, it wasn't. Uh, that was a book that I, after I wrote Revelations and after I had started Chronicles, I had this idea and I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't going to write in, in Elan anymore. So I was going to go on with my career, which was going to be now I'm going to write science fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started this notebook and I had this really elaborate look at adding stuff and adding stuff. And my wife was, you have to write another, another Royce and Hadrian book because I love them. <laughs> like, All right. So I did that. But I kept adding stuff until finally I just like, I have to write this book. And I wrote that book and Orbit said they would not publish it because it was science fiction. And that's not my genre. Mm -hmm. I said, fine, you know, I don't care. I can self-publish it. And it's mm -hmm. because, well, it was partially self-published. I kept the ebook rights, but the audio or, or the, the print went to, uh, uh, actually I can't remember the name of the publisher now. I haven't done much work with them since then. But so that was partially small press published and then the ebooks I kept myself. Mm. And I wrote that because I had a lot of information that I, as you can probably tell if you read the book, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. Uh, and I wrote that book and when I got done with it, I had planned to write at least one more book that was a sequel. Um, but I didn't know if I would get to it. So I ended it in a way that wasn't completely explanatory of everything. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it is fine, but I didn't really explain the last questionable thing. And if you've read the book, uh, it has to do with the hive mind concept. And I'm like, I sure. never really explained that out. Um, and I kind of planned to go back to that, but I never have because uh, I, my wife keeps saying, no, no, write fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> because whenever I introduce myself, and they say, you know, 
who are you? And what do you write? And I, and I, I'll say, I write science fiction and fantasy. And my wife would go, <laughs> you wrote one science fiction. Book. That counts. That counts. <laughs> I'm saying, I've been saying that all along. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for absolutely. Saying like um, Okay, so another thing, since we have brought up Royce and Hadrian several times, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you about them, because when I think of my favorite fantasy friendships and the ones that have really kind of stuck in my head the longest, they obviously are on that list. Um, and what do you think it is about Royce and Hadrian that makes the two of them so special and so loved by the fan base? And do you think there's kind of a a secret or is there something you use specifically when you're creating those relationships within your stories? Somebody had asked up there if it was based on a real relationship. <laughs> no, uh, I just, I mean, I, at the time that I wrote them, I didn't think of anything. I was just creating mm -hmm. people and, and I was creating a situation. And I mean, obviously that the obvious things are, is that, you know, they're somewhat polar opposites of one another. Yep. And, it was interesting when you have polar opposites who get along for whatever reason, it does make for an interesting dynamic. Yeah. Uh, and that's all it really was. But I mean, and I didn't realize this until my wife had brought it up years later, that there were two things that I really liked in my youth. One was uh, there was an old television show called I Spy with Robert mm -hmm. Hull and Bill Cosby, who were a couple of spies. And that was in the 60s. And then also in the 60s was uh, a movie called Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. Yep. And both of these two characters' uh, pairings is, turns out to be quite similar. They're not identical, but they're very similar in how their relationship is. Yeah. Uh, I also remember reading old or watching old like Errol Flynn movies where he would be with another character who were, they were buddies. And the humor the sort of deprecating humor between the two of them, the little bit of competition, the shorthand, the understanding that they've been together for a long time. And when they get into a situation, they're, they're, they know what's going on, but the reader or the viewer doesn't. They're like, right. all right, so we're going to have to do the thing we did before. And like, really? I hate that. And that was the kind of dynamic I was looking for. Now, I didn't really realize I was drawing from that, but obviously I did. Um, so that's probably where a lot of it came from. It's just things that I had seen when I was young and obviously I enjoyed that. So that just came up as I was creating these two characters. Yeah. Do you start with anything specific when you are designing a character for the first time or do you just kind of discovery, right? How do you kind of start that process? Characters for me are always built by plot. Mm. Um, the, whatever the plot requires, that's the character that goes into it. Uh, if I need a character to be this person, I build a character for that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't know how or why I do it, but when I create a character, they I keep envisioning them as a three-dimensional person, and mm -hmm. I don't just make... Like, for example, I've always complained about like Michael Crichton when he wrote Jurassic Park. Most of his characters, to me, seemed to be their job. That was all there was mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. I, when I make a tertiary character who you'll never see again... I, I was doing this today. I was writing a short story and I was writing a, basically a butler walks into a room and, and that's all he's going to do in that scene. And he walks in and his name is Hibberton. And I said, okay, I can't write that because I said, why is his name Hibberton? <laughs> his name is Hibberton. I said, but really he's Jack Green from Hibberton, but because he's working as a custodian in a castle, that just Jack Green didn't work. So yeah. the person who hired him said, we're going to call you Hibberton. So he started getting a backstory just because I wrote the name and that's yeah. how things happen. So as I write the character, the more I write them, the, the, the more depth they have. And I don't know why I do that. I just evolve. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's awesome because it just adds so much more depth to the world in general. And even the sideline characters that show up for a few minutes or a few pages are, um, you know, actually a person. <laughs> They're not just a stand in cutout. And that comes in handy because if you create, all your characters that way. And I hate making new things. Obviously the whole idea of me not mm -hmm. wanting to make the world uh, because I'm lazy. I don't like to make new people. So if I create a character and I make you as a reader read about that character, if I can, and I need a new character to do something, I will use an old character because they're already there and you've already read right. about them. So I'll just pull them in and it's weird things happen. Like you have an evil character that suddenly becomes good because that's what I needed at that time. So how can I make them good? Well, I'll work that out and work that in and make it happen. And it, adds depth and kind of churns and, and mixes the story up a little better. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have to ask because I think outside of Royce and Hadrian, um, my favorite character in Revelations by a long shot was Myron. Um, so I have to ask where, if he came from anywhere specific or I just, he's such a delightful character. <laughs> I adored him. <laughs> so when I wrote uh, The Crown Conspiracy, I wrote that in a month. And uh, I also wrote a birth in the following month. But when I was writing it, I was just making stuff up as I went. And originally they were going to be traveling to an inn because that happens or a, tra a tavern because it happens every time. I'm like, ah, that happens all the time. <laughs> Where can I send them? I can send them to a monastery. Oh, that's what it is. So I sent her to the monastery and it's like, oh, this is interesting. But I really didn't want to do the whole description of the monastery at the time. So I sent them there at night and, and there's this person talking to them. And, and, and suddenly I thought of this idea that I went, I'm not describing anything. And I went, well, what if there's something wrong here? I went, oh, suddenly it started getting more interesting. I don't want to actually spoil it for anyone who wants to read it. Mm -hmm. uh, but something is definitely wrong at this monastery. And they meet this very unusual person. And I came up with this concept that I wanted a monk, but I wanted to be an interesting monk. And I thought, and I don't know where the idea came from, but I I, I was I researched, you know, monasteries and that how they they're isolated mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, if someone was like living there all his life he wouldn't know anything mm -hmm. but if this person was like a librarian and he had eidetic memory and he could like know this i went and that when it came up this idea that this person has a photographic memory he's read all these books he knows all this stuff but he has absolutely zero experience with the world and he's a monk so he's one redeeming feature is he's he's just very kind and yeah decent and of course, the problems he went through makes him even more sympathetic. And when I got done creating this character, I paused and I went, I don't think I've ever read a character like this before. And this should have been invented before. And I don't remember having encountered one. And I asked other people, that, yeah, they haven't come up with it. So I feel like that's the one unique character I've ever created. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until later, much later, uh, that I happened to be watching a, a I think it, it's a Pixar show. And I realized that someone had recreated Myron. And his name is Wally. Ah, yep. <laughs> everything, every dynamic of a character is in Wally. And he's this happy, content, capable person who has an awful life. And yet he doesn't seem to care. And he yeah. all care about other people. I'm like, that's Myron. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know pretty much every author, I feel like, has the one character where the fan base would just, you know, completely riot if anything happens to this well, character <laughs> with him uh when he is leaving the monastery and mm. i started writing what's known as the squirrel tree scene it's not yes real. and i started writing the scene and it was the first time i think ever that i was writing a scene and i actually started to tear up and i started to cry mm. like that. and i went i gotta take this out this is this is it's too personal it's too sappy it's like this is embarrassing. I don't want this in the book. But every time I read it, it moved, emotionally moved me so much. And it's really like, it's like four sentences. It's not much at all. I'm not going to have to keep this in, although I feel like cringe word. I'm like, I don't want people to read this. <laughs> and invariably, I've had many people who have read that book and they said it was the squirrel tree scene. At that moment, they realized they wanted to read more of my books. Yeah. 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 Because that's the, I mean, you know, what we put into our books theoretically the uh, the readers will you know feel that emotion through the pages which is obviously what happened there so that's awesome and then i realized that was a thing so i still do it started doing <laughs> still do, did more of it <laughs> yeah um if, if you haven't got there yet but when you get to legends uh the legend series yeah that's gonna rip your heart out many times oh i'm 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 very excited i for some reason as a lot of fantasy fans do do enjoy that experience for whatever strange yeah. reason so <laughs> here we are I'll make, you, I'll make you laugh and I'll make you cry both for sadness and happiness. So that's always good. Perfect. Um, talking about research for Myron, um, we had a question, how much research does it take for an author to write certain topics, not within your expertise, writing a female character, personality, goals, motivations, or a monastery? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, well, so I actually have I'm a mold, so I've done a lot of things. <laughs> Unlike many new authors who haven't had a chance, uh, but like I've been asked, like, how do you know so much about horses and horse riding and saddling? I'm like, oh, I used to ride horses. I used to have a horse, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and so I know a lot of things. And 
I was writing, you probably haven't got to it yet, but there's a book that has a, an oil painter in it. And I'm like I said, mm. I do art. So I used, I studied, you know, how to do mm -hmm. portrait. So I knew some of that. For the stuff I didn't know, uh, it's there's this amazing thing. You probably never heard about it. I think it's called uh, YouTube. Mm. And they yeah. have a lot of information there. Uh, Is that a library? So, yeah, it's on <laughs> mine. It's really cool. But literally, when I was started writing, I was I was writing mostly in Vermont and the, yeah. before the internet, and the nearest library was two hours away. So that mm -hmm. was a problem. Uh, since then, the internet has been very good. But yeah, I mean, I can literally go online. I can watch a video of someone doing something. Like, there's been numerous things, like how to dye wool, how to spin and mm. card and weave wool, how to uh, do you know metallurgy, how to mm -hmm. literally did they originally do you know, forming of swords back when they would bury it in coals and that kind of thing. I mean, yeah, so there's a lot of information out there, but every time, one of the things I do try and do is in, I don't hand wave that stuff. I actually will look it up and yep. put that in because I feel, I've always liked when I read books and I thought I learned something. I don't know yeah. if most people look at fantasy books as something where they can be educated. Like, well, I would rather read nonfiction because I'll learn something from that. So I try to put things in there that make sense, even when it comes to cliches. Mm -hmm. I don't like doing cliches, except if I can show you the original cliche and how it got changed. Uh, those are always fun because like the famous one is uh, you can have your cake and eat it too, which is wrong. It's backwards. It should be you should eat your cake and have it too because that makes more sense because <laughs> you don't have it. So, but it's been changed to one hour. It doesn't even make sense anymore. And things like three sheets to the wind. This, do you know what that means? Yeah. It, it means there are three ropes that support a sail that have come loose. Because a sheet is not a sail, it's a rope. So these are things that you wouldn't know. And by explaining this, I can actually educate people. And I kind of like that. And I think readers like that too. I'm yeah. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned um, spinning and wool dyeing. I'm actually also a fiber artist and I can do oh. all of those things. So I'm hoping I'd really like to put a section of that in one of my fantasy novels in the future and really dig into some of the, you know, right. shepherding and shearing and all that kind of stuff. Because it is it is really fun to be able to share life experiences that we've had. Um, yeah. Um, Mark Lawrence is here for the cake. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron says, just hopped on, read the Revelation series for the first time this year. Love the characters. Great time reading the story and appreciate your work. Thank you. Um, so kind of shifting a little bit into publishing and the industry, um, you've obviously seen a pretty widespread of what the industry has done in terms of changes and trends and sort of and all of that kind of stuff. What do you see being kind of the biggest changes you've seen within self-publishing specifically since you started? Oh, self-publishing. Uh, well, and generally in, in publishing in general is the fact that there was uh, there was such a thing as eBooks mm -hmm. that revolutionized everything. And then yep. audiobooks, audiobooks yeah. then revolutionized everything again. Uh, now there's like Kickstarters, which yep. is get huge as well. Uh, another thing that we're looking at right now, which is really fascinating, uh, is serialized fiction, uh, like yep. Will Road and Wattpad and those kinds of things, which are doing phenomenally well for authors. Authors in, in independent authors have a problem because while they produce well, they get it out there and they have a lot more. There's another change is the fact that there's people who will do covers for you, do layouts for you, do all yeah. that kind of fun stuff, which never existed before. But you can get that done. But getting exposure is a problem, which is one of the reasons why a lot of people go traditional because you get a, a broader uh, exposure that way. But these serialized companies uh, or platforms, you should say, are providing a lot of that. I mean, there mm -hmm. are people who are brand new that are getting millions of views that wouldn't you wouldn't get that as a normal traditional or indie published author. You wouldn't even right. get that as a as a traditional published author. So. That's kind of the new thing we're seeing now. But I mean, over the years, it was the fact that everything was print and, right. and, and, and it went the, the age old. You get a hardcover that was followed by a mass market to the little guys, yep. um, which, quite frankly, if you're in traditional publishing, you don't make much money off of those at all. Um, so those were kind of replaced out or are being replaced out by ebooks because it's the same concept and it doesn't cost as much to make. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how that's happening. But then 
audiobooks took off massively. That became the huge yeah. thing. And it still is right now. I mean, yeah. that's, that's where a lot of the money is going. That's where a lot of the people are listening because obviously, you know, when it first started, it was for people who were blind and, you know, you would, they would cost a ridiculous amount of money. Nowadays, you get a subscription, you listen to it on your, your phone uh, and, and it, you get in your cars, people have a lot of, you know, commuting to do it. It's always very popular. That is a huge place for it. Yeah. Um, now, like I said, you have these other sites that are for, uh, yeah, like Kindle Unlimited, which is a subscription thing. Uh, that's another great way for people who, who just love reading and they're not specific. I, I will, I want to read this or that just like, I just like to read. Yeah. And so that's huge for that. And I guess the serial things are also kind of rolling into that. Now, the other interesting thing I found is the fact that there's something called the, uh, oh uh, shoot. I can't recall the name of it lit rpg ah yep that's become massively huge huge yep um, and it's weird because traditional publishers aren't even touching that and i'm not mm -hmm. sure why exactly i guess maybe they don't feel it will transition well to traditional publishing uh but yeah th those are massively and obviously they're tapping into readers who have grown up with computer games yeah this is something they really love but that's not something that traditional is interested in so but there are some new uh you know, smaller publishers who are now starting to facilitate and, and pick these people up. Uh, so, yeah, those are kind of the biggest things that I've seen uh, in major trends. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned um, Kickstarters, too. So if, if you having run a successful uh, Kickstarter yourself, how would you go about that if, you know, you're somebody that's new that's looking into the Kickstarters to kind of jumpstart their books? How would you set that up for success? Well, I would hand it over to my wife. She's one who does it. But, uh, <laughs> Call Robin. <laughs> there, there's another thing. I mean, that really is a question for her. But there is another thing that has happened in the industry. Like I was saying, when we first started, there was no such thing as artists. I mean, you might be able to go on DeviantArt and ask someone yep. to do a cover for you. Now there's whole yep. industries. There's people who you can, that they will do all kinds of covers for you. Yeah. Same thing with layouts for books and, and all this. Thing here. But there's now starting an industry, and we actually started it. Uh, we did Kickstarters, and I had my, my wife had my son. Uh, start a little business where he would he would uh, do kickstarters for other authors and some of the authors that he did kickstarters for realized they could do that mm -hmm. so they they like would you ma be mad if we did it i'm like no of course not we, we need more of this so there's a number of of authors uh ac cobble is a good example he ah. we, we kind of taught him how to do it and now he's doing it for other people he's done quite a few actually yeah um and there's different industries that are popping up for that. I think Wraithmark was Wraithmark was doing yep. for a while as well. I'm not sure if they're still doing it. They might be. They are, yeah. So there, there's there's certain people. So if you wanted to do that and you don't know the first thing about it, you might want to talk to these people because uh, they kind of know what's going on. Uh, and if not that, I mean, if you really want to do a really good Kickstarter, <laughs> find one of mine that my wife did and just copy it. <laughs> <laughs> and quite frankly, she tells you to do that. Feel yeah. free. You can totally rip us off. Use our, our standards for all the you know stretch goals and, and set it up the same way. But one of the most important things, I suppose, if my wife was here, she would tell you that you, you should really do a good video for it. Yeah. And this is bad because authors are not personal people. I was up in an in front of an audium, auditorium one time talking about writing and there are all these writers out there. And I said, the one thing you have to learn how to do is sell your books. And I said, yeah. and I know you don't want to do that because there's no one here. Everyone here became a writer because they don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the applause was thunderous at that point because like, right. you would agree they do not want to sell their books. They do not want to yeah. talk to people. That's why they became authors. Um, <laughs> but you really have to do that. And yeah. you're not selling your book. That's the thing you have to get through your head. Mark Twain would have explained this much better in the fact that it's not just the book you're selling. It's you. People mm -hmm. buy the idea. They buy the author. That's yep. when you read my bio. That's why my bio is written that way. I'm selling my story. And yep. that's what authors need to do. You have yep. to sell you like you're a character in your own book. You have to get out there and you have to explain to people not what the book is, but why you wrote it. And people will follow your reason for doing it. If you say, you know, I've always wanted to read this kind of book and it just doesn't exist. So this is why I did this. Mm -hmm. And this is how I did this. And I want you to be a part of that dream. People will respond.
Yeah. If you want to make a good Kickstarter, that's how you do it. Yeah. And you copy my wife's stuff. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I think that's such an important thing. And and I've done a lot of entrepreneurial pursuits in my lifetime, too. And it's it's such a true statement that you're selling yourself before you're selling your product, because like you said, you're building that. And especially in this generation, I feel like because relationships are so such a big part of, we want to know, okay, well, I'm not just buying something. Who am I buying it from? Um, So, yeah, I think that's absolutely really gold advice for anybody who's watching this and and taking notes. my good friend Andrew De Meredith uh, is editing. He's an incredibly talented uh, epic fantasy writer and audiobook narrator. Um, good for him. Yeah, Kareem. Huh? He's gonna make a mint. <laughs> he's very good. Um, he's actually gonna be doing the audiobook for my epic fantasy novel uh, coming out at the end of the oh. year. So very excited about that. Kareem says, just passing by to say, hi, I still remember all those insightful discussions on Wattpad nine years ago about publishing. Learned a lot. We'll always appreciate them. Good. Another indie writer. And then Philip Crane Trell. I need to meet you, Michael, so much I could talk to you about. <laughs> <laughs> Philip's awesome. He's another, there's so many, there's so many fantasy authors in the chat right now. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of publishing because you've i mean you've really run the gamut in terms of you've worked with small press you've you've done self-publishing you've worked with the traditionally published houses um for somebody who's watching this who might be at the very beginning of their journey to publishing their first books how would you like what advice would you give them starting out in terms of setting themselves up for long term success? Because you've really built that kind of upward uh, climb for yourself with your own books. Hmm. Uh, well, it, it it's not something that you can just answer. Uh, it has mm-hmm. to do with uh, it's tailored to you before you had one option. That's no longer the case. You have a lot of options now, uh, yeah. but it really has to do with who you are, what you're comfortable with and what you want. Yeah. Um, it, this was more so in the past, I think nowadays, uh, both my wife and I are kind of trending more toward being more, uh, positive toward indie as opposed to yeah. traditional because of how the, the world is changing in the publishing industry. It seems to be shifting a little bit more now toward, particularly in fantasy, uh, it seems to be tri- you know, shifting a little bit more toward indies are doing a little better than traditional. Um, but it really does depend who you are and what you want. Uh, if you're indie, it's going to be really hard for you to get into bookstores and that may be something that's really important to you. Also, there's that credibility factor and there's also the ability that what I didn't realize when I first went into traditional, uh, I was doing extremely well self, but when I went into traditional, I didn't realize I thought I was going to be losing a lot of money. Mm-hmm. It turned out that that opened some doors I didn't expect. Now, I knew it would expand my audience, but it, it literally like tripled it, which was unexpected. Yeah. But more importantly, what I didn't know was it opened foreign sales to me because uh, other countries are much more comfortable picking up things from traditional publishing houses. And that was a huge income revenue stream that I did not expect to be picking up. Um, so those are things you don't really notice. Also, when you work with a traditional publisher, they teach you things. It's like before you hang out your own shingle to do anything, you work for someone, you know, yeah. you learn the ropes and then you can do it yourself. I learned a lot while working with traditional and published uh, houses. On the other hand, they will, and they've gotten really right scrabby uh, to mm-hmm. where they're, they, they used to be just, it used to be just the big deal between print and ebook. Like, why do you need the ebook? You don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> now they want print ebook and, audio. And that's a problem because audio is so lucrative that right. the amount of money that I can get for an audiobook is like three times what they'll give me for all my rights, which is, right. just doesn't make sense. It's one of the reasons why I'm not traditionally published right now, because it doesn't make, you know, economic sense for me. I mean, it's just, right. stupid. I'd be throwing money out the window for that. Yeah. Um, particularly when you realize that you could make like double what you would if you went with a traditionally published house, and you also get to keep your ebook and print rights. <laughs> it's like right. hey, that, that's kind of hard to pass up. Right. Um, now the problem is, if you really want to be in, uh, you know, 
a bookstore, you can do that. You have to be more creative though. You have to be able to find a smaller publisher who'd be willing to put you just in print, get a print only deal. Now those are hard to do, granted. Uh, it has been done and you might need to get a larger following before you can get to that point. But that's the whole thing. If you can't get traditionally published, self-publish, build up an audience, prove mm -hmm. to them that this is something that's gonna be making them money yeah. those numbers to them and they'll probably be interested in picking you up. Uh, and then like with me, I go back and forth uh, and I'm probably gonna be staying indie from now on just cause it's a lot easier. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, if, if you play both fields, you're going to get more readers. And the interesting thing is this happens for everything. When we went and did a Kickstarter, we did a Kickstarter to prove to other authors who were having trouble getting their books published because they would not do well and they would the publisher would drop them like i really wish i could finish this I'm like well do that and i said yeah because well, i don't need money i said we do a kickstarter they said that, that won't work so we had to prove it but what we learned was not only can you actually get the money to do that but when you, we went to kickstarter we found a whole new audience right there were people there that we had, had never heard of me and most of my backers were not fans they were new people yeah so if you go to traditional, you'll find a whole bunch of people. If you go to indie, you'll find a bunch of people. If you go to Kickstarter, you'll find a bunch of people. If you go to serialize things like Royal Road or, or Wapit, you'll find a whole bunch of people. Every time you go into a new area, you're going to find a larger group of readers. And if you do that enough, you're going to just mass out your, your, your reader base, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what, you know, from self pub in the in previous years to now, there's just the opportunities that present themselves for people trying to get off the ground are just so endless, I think. And, you know, you can be more creative because you've got more options to try and see what works for you and, and what have you. So I think I'm I'm feeling very much better <laughs> about, you know, publishing at the end of this year than I would have five, even five years ago because I have so many more resources to utilize now. And the cool thing is that it's, there is a community too of a lot of people that are supportive and all intertwined. And like you said, with other art forms like the illustrators and the yes. um, formatters, and it's, there's just such, so much more of a community around self-pub now, which is very cool. True. So, and, yeah. and basically, you know, your, your self-pub people are, unusually helpful to one another yeah uh, um, in the old days that traditionally published weren't unhelpful but there was blocks put in their way in the same yeah. way you work with someone like well you're not supposed to talk about how much you make i'm like why not right because you know other people would be upset but there was also i think possibly the case where people weren't making as much as they seemed to be so they didn't want yeah. to share this information and there was less community uh, and a little bit less uh, sharing that was going on. Yeah. Unless of course, you went to a cocktail bar in New York and then there was a lot more that you <laughs> wanted. Uh, yeah. That happens. <laughs> I bet everybody shares all of the information that you didn't know you needed. <laughs> um, so my final question for you is just what is next for you as a writer? Because you said Rise in the Fall is a trilogy and the third one's coming out this year. Yes. So you're kind of open road ahead. What is what's next? Don't know. Um, I mean, obviously, I would like to at this point say I'm done with Alon and move on to something completely different, which would probably be outside the genre. Uh, however, uh, in finishing this book, uh, there's been some question as to, there's some questions that haven't been answered. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, when I you finished Revelations and it mm -hmm. ends well, it has mm -hmm. a very nicely tied up thing, and I didn't want to go beyond that, and I still don't yeah. want to go beyond yeah. that because it, it it works out. I mean, how often do you get an ending that ties up so nicely, neatly? Yeah. So, and as I explained to you, I wanted each book to get better than one before, so that meant the last book had to be fantastic, which it was. The stakes were high, the odds were impossible, so it was just this blowout ending, and. I can't beat that. So mm -hmm. it's already beyond it. Unless I were to go back in time and create a whole new series where I build a whole new story arc like Babylon mm -hmm. 5. And I did that. And then I brought that over with another series in the middle where I added some other things that builds more to the sto larger story arc that goes even above the Revelation story arc. 
and I did that. So there's a possibility using this, I could build something beyond. Right. And unfortunately, however, and this didn't come up in this conversation, is the fact that I don't like to pre- release a book uh, until I've written the entire series out. Mm. It allows me to go back and change things and I can line yep. things up better. And if I come up with a great idea, I can go back and do it. And I did this simply because I didn't plan on publishing those first books and that's how I got in this habit, but I really like it. Yeah. Uh, so, but for this final thing, the amount of groundwork and foundation that I have to put in uh, will require me to write more than one book before I even get to writing the final series. Mm. And I'm not going to be wanting to release much of any of that until I know it's going to work because this is really hard. I have to take a world that I've created happenstance for almost two decades now Mm -hmm. and then take that and complete a shell over it that makes it look as if everything I ever wrote made perfect sense and was intentional. (laughs) Not easy to do. And then with that many books for sure. Then I have to top it all. Yeah. And all this has to make sense, make logical concept. And, and I'm like, that's that's a tall order. Mm-hmm. So I won't do it if I can't make it work. Because what I don't want to do is put out a book and or a series and have people go, you know what? I really love the writer revelations, but he just ruined it. I can't even mm-hmm. read it now. It sucks. You know, I don't want to do that. So yeah. I have to create a lot of books, work it all out, make sure it function and it is good before I will release any of them. So that's why there might be a hiatus of books from me. Now, I'm sure. grooming door coming out, which is going to be another uh, Royce and Adrian book. And I think I'll probably have a short story coming out, which I've been working on. Um, and all of these things now, including Ezra Hodden, are setups for what might come. And I'm yeah. putting things in place. I don't know if it's going to come to fruition. Just leaving yourself some doors. I'm making a, ch- I'm making, you know, the, building it up so that maybe, maybe I'd be able to do this. And, and hopefully I can. If I yeah. can, it's be really cool. If I can, it's going to be a huge waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I feel like, I mean, goodness, you've put out so many books in this world and written so many, you know, starting points for people to to get into it. I feel like a hiatus might be well-deserved at this point. If you're, <laughs> <laughs> you've written a lot of books. <laughs> True. But unfortunately yeah. for me, it, it, it's not work. I enjoy doing it. So yeah. I'll keep doing it. Um, yeah. Just There might be, a, you know, a desert period where I don't. While you're working on the next one. Yeah. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because I actually have books sitting in, in those black books to the left of my head up there. Um, those are notebooks. And I actually have novels completely outlined and ready to go, which wow. I probably won't write <laughs> because I'll be writing this. And I'm yeah. like those may never get written because by the time I get done with this, I mean, another decade could go by and I don't think I'm going to live that long. Uh, I hope I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I hope you do. <laughs> I'm sure your fans do too. And I was as your wife probably as well, I would assume. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of um, it's, it's kind of a smart way to go about it, though, you know, putting all of the and I know other people have done that, too. Um, my friend Philip Chase here on YouTube, just he'd been working on his fantasy trilogy for like 18 years. And then he's releasing the three books all within a few months of each other. And I think there's something to that because, you know, exactly you've been yeah. through the whole thing and you you know, it works and, you know, it all ties together. There's definitely something to that. Well, when I was writing Revelations, I got near the end and there was going to be a really bad ending to it. Um, but at the last minute, I figured out a better ending. So I was able but to make that work. I had to make changes in book two and yep. four, and I couldn't have done that if things were already on the shelf. So, exactly. yeah, that's, that's why I like to keep the doors open for myself. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, I want to say thank you so much for generously sharing your time with us on the channel. And for anybody who is watching the replay or watching in the chat, I do have uh, Michael's information down in the description box. So you can go check out his website and all of the books and choose your entry point if you haven't already. Um, but thank you so much for, for sharing and for being on the channel today. You're welcome. And thank you for being a wonderful host. Oh, and, uh, <laughs> this was enjoyable. my pleasure. You did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody in the chat for hanging out with us and we will see you in the next video. Bye guys. Bye-bye.